It's time once again for Dialogue Conspiracy with May Russell. For the past 14 years, May has been researching and uncovering facts and evidence from between the lines of the news and placing them in a more thorough perspective of how conspiracy, political assassination, and abuses of power affect us all. Dialogue Conspiracy originates with KLRB-FM in Carmel, California. And now, May Russell. Good evening. This is May Russell in Carmel, California. This is Dialogue Conspiracy number 303, and it is January the 1st. 1978. We have to get used to that date. Last week on Dialogue Conspiracy, I had a part one series. This evening will be a continuation, part two of the Gemstone Files. I got about 40 letters from people that listen to Dialogue Conspiracy or take the tapes asking me for a summary and analysis of the Gemstone Files. I did some of it last week, and I'm going to go right into it now. For those of you that weren't here last week or didn't hear it, the gemstone file, is the key to the gemstone, is a document about 20 pages long. It's a summary of approximately 350 handwritten pages written by Bruce Roberts. Uh, some sources say there's a 1,000 pages, but I've never seen them. <clears throat> and as far as I know, I'm the only researcher in this country that has all of the uh, handwritten pages of Bruce Roberts, and I have copied them and put them away where they can't be harmed or taken. And he wrote a story of uh, the political power elite from the late 30s up to through Watergate and up to his death. He died of a brain tumor about a year ago. Bruce lived in San Francisco, and he gave me his research at the time of Watergate because he wanted me to know what he thought was the story behind Watergate, what led up to it. And because he had been at a certain uh, bar in San Francisco on Geary Street where the Watergate defendants uh, used to hang around. Right after Watergate arrest, the bartender there was killed. And I did go into that bar a couple of times to see what was going on. He claimed that G. Gordon Liddy and E. Howard Hunt and John Ehrlichman and most of the Watergate defendants had an active role in their CIA intelligence work in San Francisco and uh, hung around this bar. And he gave me a lot of information, which has been circulating around the world. Many people have it. And as I say, they want to make a movie about the gemstone key file in England. Parts of this file are true. Parts of them are absolutely untrue. Some of it is difficult to check. Some of it I have used for my own research and writing. And uh, it's a very controversial document because it's filled with a lot of misinformation. I'm going to give some quotations of the gemstone file this week and analyze them as much as we have time for and uh, do a critique of some of the information that I think is bad information. There's one section of the gemstone file that is particularly interesting and controversial, and it has to do with the role of the present pope, is, is Cardinal Montini, who he had made the allegations, Bruce Roberts had been said that the pope was part of the international narcotics traffic with the mafia and the CIA since his early days as a cardinal. It, in quotes, this is from the Genstone file, he said, the battle of the mafia narcotics traffic has been tangled with the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, specifically the Vatican and the Pope. It was Bruce Roberts who told me in 1972 that this current Pope was in the OSS and that he was linked to the gold triangle narcotics traffic in Southeast Asia at, that particularly escalated during the Vietnamese War. A year later, after he told me this information, a book came out on the history of the OSS, and it did link Cardinal Montini, who then became the Pope, as being in the OSS for the United States. And many people know that almost every agent in the OSS then became a, an officer or an agent of the CIA. Uh, recently, there is a new book out that I quoted on Dialogue Conspiracy called Treason for My Daily Bread, which has to do with Cardinal Montini, naming him as the person who assisted Martin Bormann, the Nazi, and other Nazis to leave Italy and go to South America, that they went from Austria to Brenner Pass disguised as monks. And um, there's this information that is new about the Cardinal Montini, the Pope, working uh, with Martin Bormann, the Nazi. In addition to that, the gemstone file refers to Cardinal Tisserand. He was the head of the College of Cardinals at the Vatican. And Bruce Roberts claimed that he was murdered with sodium morphate. He said Tisserand had followed the career 
of this present Pope Montini, and that's the reason that he was murdered, Tisserand was murdered. He said Montini had also poisoned Pope Pius XI in order to become the Pope, and that he was banished from Rome for a time being uh, by Pope Pius XII and then returned and became the present Pope in 1963, the year that Diem was murdered and John Kennedy was murdered. Bruce Roberts wrote in the Gemstone File that Tisserand wrote all of this down in his diaries, and at the time he called uh, the present Pope, uh, th that was Cardinal Montini then, the Deputy of Christ at Auschwitz, meaning the extermination camp. And he said that Montini was the fulfillment of the Fatima prophecy that the Antichrist shall rise to become the head of the church. Now, this is pretty heavy stuff uh, for a person to put in your hands, these allegations of the cardinal, and it has been confirmed the role of the present pope in helping Martin Borman and the Nazis escape. But the murder charges were never written up or discussed until just 1977. A new book came out two months ago called The Assassination Theory and Practice. It's put out by Richard Chameleon by Palladin Press in Colorado. It's 1977 publication. And I'll just read you a couple of sentences from this book, which is the first book that I've seen or own that would back up Bruce Roberts' allegations. And these are quotations from the book. It says, A suggestion of intrigue surrounds the depth of Pope Pius XI. He died in bed in the Vatican at the age of 81. To his very last, Pope Pius XI was the deadly enemy of fascism, Benito Mussolini, and Adolf Hitler. Shortly before he died, Eugene Cardinal Tisserand was directed to convene a meeting of all Italian bishops to hear what His Holiness had to say, and what he had to say was against Nazism and fascism. Just before the meeting was to take place, Pope Pius XI was given what they called a stimulant. It was an injection. And an hour later, His Holiness was dead so that he couldn't meet with the bishops to object to Hitler's fascism or Mussolini's fascism. And the author asked in this book, where is the evidence for assassination? He said, it is historical fact that Claretta Petucci was Benito Mussolini's mistress for eight years. Along with Mussolini, she was executed. Petucci happened to be a fanatical pro-fascist, pro-Mussolini follower. Is it purely by chance or sheer coincidence that the father of Claretta Petucci, the woman who lived with Mussolini, his name was Dr. Francesco Petucci, was the senior Vatican physician who gave Pope Pius XI the injection, allegedly the stimulant, the hour before he died. Pope Pius was to meet and discuss with the bishops the evils of fascism, both German and Italian. Was Pope Pius XI murdered? This is in this new book on assassinations, and it is an excellent book. It just came out, and uh, it goes into the origin of assassinations from the various countries and the way they're done. It's the first book that I've read in print that has linked Marina Oswald to the CIA, and that is a big jump in terms of information, that her uncle wasn't necessarily with the KGB, but the branches of the CIA, which was in fact true. So Richard Chameleon asked the question, was the Pope murdered? And in the Gemstone Files, Bruce Roberts had said in 1972 that both Tisserand and Pope Pius XI were murdered, and that would make sense if uh, Cardinal Montini was working with the Nazis, if he was described as the Christ at Auschwitz, if he was in favor of letting Martin Bormann and the head Nazis go out of Italy, out of Austria to Italy, to South America, and if this man was in charge of the Pope's health and his daughter lived with Benito Mussolini and they were confirmed fascists and the Pope was objecting to fascism, uh, it's a good question uh, coming out in literature now. Was the Pope murdered for his anti-fascist stance? And why would the father of this woman who lived with Mussolini all these years be the one giving the injection to the anti-fascist Pope? So putting that together, the gemstone file has certainly some provocative questions to ask, and I'm not putting it all down because it's that kind of information that does uh, whet your appetite. There's another section of the gemstone files where he makes the statement, two murders had to occur before John Kennedy was killed in order to get away with this killing. And he cites Senator Estes Kefauver. He said his crime commission had uncovered the original deal in 1932 between Aristotle Onassis 
Joe Kennedy, the father of John Kennedy, and Meyer Lansky for the international narcotic swingling that they were doing. And Keith Alber was planning a speech on the Senate floor to denounce these mafia operations. Instead, he ate a piece of apple pie laced with sodium morphate, had a sodium morphate-induced heart attack on the Senate floor. The second murder that he says had to take place was Philip Graham, the editor of the Washington Post, who was married to Catherine Meyer. And uh, Bruce Roberts says in the Jamstone Files that Eugene Meyer's daughter, uh, Catherine, was to take over the mafia-controlled Washington Post, and they also own the Newsweek. And uh, Graham was a very strong John Kennedy uh, worker. He put together the John Kennedy Lyndon Johnson ticket. He was Kennedy's best friend in a struggle against the power of Onassis and the mafia. This is from the Gemstone File. He said Catherine Meyer Graham bribed the psychiatrist to certify that her husband was insane. He was allowed out of the asylum for the weekend. He died of a gunshot wound in the head, and the death was ruled as a suicide. I don't know and have no way to check out the links of Eugene Meyer and his links to the mafia. This were, was an allegation made by Bruce Roberts that I cannot support. I do support the belief that Philip Graham was... Uh, murdered, that this suicide was like the death of George de Morinshield. I believe he did have to die at that time, and the circumstances of his death it gave Catherine Graham tremendous power, which she has wielded even in the role of the Washington Post getting Richard Nixon out of office in their one-sided investigations. The power of the Washington Post and Newsweek combined with Henry Luce's power in time and life and their syndicate fortune is overwhelming with the assassins. They work hand in glove with the CIA mafia connected links. Um, I don't know how much Senator Estes Kefauver knew. I know that the man who worked with him, who would have been uh, controlling his campaign if Kefauver ran for vice president, was Bernard Fensterwald of the CIA, one of the dirtiest dogs to walk the face of Washington. He's a Senate lawyer. He turned up at the time of Watergate and uh, became the attorney for James McCord. I've known Fenster Walt, unfortunately, for quite a few years, at least eight or nine, and I have utmost contempt for him, and I can link him, uh, at least physically, in the presence of situations where people died in two cases just weeks, seven or eight weeks after he was present. I don't trust Fenster Walt, and I don't know what role he had at the time, going way back with the Kefauver death, but in the gemstone files, two deaths are necessary, according to Bruce Roberts, and those were Keith Alver and Philip Graham. I think the death of Marilyn Monroe that took place just uh, a month or so before John Kennedy killed was a primary death or murder that had to take place because with her relationships with John and Robert Kennedy, it could hush Robert Kennedy up and they could blackmail him from not investigating his brother's murder. I think the Marilyn Monroe death was more important in my research, but for reasons that he never documents or goes into detail, uh, Bruce Roberts said that Keith Alver's death and Philip Graham's were primary before the Kennedy assassination took place. Now, where Ro Bruce Roberts gets way off base, I believe, is in the story of the Kennedy assassination, and because that's the area I know the best, I have to use it as a yardstick to base the value of some of the other information, which I can't get into. Uh, his account of the Dealing Plaza uh, killing of John Kennedy goes this way. He says there were four shooters, Lee Harvey Oswald, Eugene Brading, Jimmy Fratriano, and John Rosselli. E. Howard Hunt, James McCord were at Dealing Plaza, and Frank Sturgis was in Miami. It's the other way around. There's no proof that Lee Harvey Oswald shot any gun November 22, 1963, so I don't believe that Oswald was one of the shooters at all. There's no evidence that McCord and Hunt were at Daly Plaza. There are no photographs of them that could confirm that. But there's reason to believe Frank Sturgis was there, so I believe that Bruce Roberts has turned this around. He goes on to say that Fratriano, Jimmy Fratriano, shot from the Dow, Texas building. Now, I can't say that Fratriano did or didn't shoot at the time of the Kennedy assassination. He's been called before the House Select Committee. Uh, to testify about where he was, except for the fact that he did publicly say Kennedy should be killed. And he did work with Robert Mayhew and the CIA mafia assassination teams. There has been no photograph of Fadriana in the Dallas-Fort Worth area up to or after the assassination. Nobody said they saw him there or registered as any alias. Uh, that doesn't mean he wasn't there. 
But up till now, there's been no proof that Fratriano was there at all. And I have the feeling that the assassins were better trained, as I said before on this program, in Oaxaca, Mexico, by Albert Osborne, and that they were not this assassination team. This team may have picked up some shells at Dealey Plaza. He says Fratriano shot from the Daltex building, but has no supporting document or photograph to prove it. Bruce Roberts said that John Roselli shot John Kennedy once on the right side of the head, blew his brains out from behind the fence. Again, this is uh, questionable. Nobody saw John Roselli at Dealey Plaza. He was well-known mafia man in 1963. Uh, that doesn't mean he wasn't there. But he says categorically that Fratriano shot one shot from the Daltex and Roselli did the fatal shot. The third point of triangulation, he claimed, was supplied by Eugene Brading from that small pagoda at Dealey Plaza. Now, Brading is a mafia member who later went on to join the early La Costa gang down in uh, San Clemente when that resort opened. Brading was seen at Dealey Plaza, and he was given aliases, and he did walk over the Dow Tex building afterwards to make a telephone call. He could have left a gun in the bushes that one of the other men picked up. I know Oswald didn't shoot a gun November 22, 1963. I don't know where Fratriano was. John Roselli is dead. Uh, killed right after he testified before the Senate House Select Committee. And Eugene Brading has never been called to testify before anyone. So I just give you the allegations and what I think of them. Um, I also have this statement here from the Gemstone file. Bruce Roberts said, Lee Harvey Oswald shot John Kenley twice, John Conley, twice from the Texas School Book Depository. He left the front door of the building with his rifle in the building. There was a backup man. Instead of taking it out, they left it so that Oswald would be the patsy. I don't believe that Lee Harvey Oswald shot John Conley twice at all. If he were going to be the patsy, they would have left the bullets um, around the car that they were in or in the hospital to positively link them to Lee Harvey Oswald's gun. There were no bullets found except a pristine bullet numbered at Commission Exhibit 399, and that doesn't link to Lee Harvey Oswald in any sense, and there were no fingerprints on the rifle that was supposed to be Lee Harvey Oswald's, and the direction of the shots couldn't have come from the sixth floor window the way that John Connolly was shot. The paraffin tests on Lee Harvey Oswald were negative on his head and hands. Um, he couldn't have fired a weapon that day without holding the gun. There is no way to link Lee Harvey Oswald to any weapon Therefore, I don't believe that he shot John Connolly twice, and I think that Bruce Roberts is filled, in this case, with this information. Uh, Marina Oswald was recently on a national television show saying that Lee Harvey Oswald wrote a letter from USSR to John Connolly saying that when I come home, I want to work for you. Well, John Connolly was Secretary of the Navy when Oswald was in the Navy. He was the governor of Texas at the time, and being as he was an important agent when the U-2 flight was downed and Oswald was in Russia, I think that uh, his contacts to Conley were more friendly than people believe. And I don't believe he shot anybody, and I don't believe what Bruce Roberts said about uh, Oswald shooting John Conley. The gemstone file also says that three men were dressed as tramps, then picked up shells from the ground at Dealey Plaza, and one of the men was Howard Hunt. He said a Dallas police officer ordered two Dallas cops to go over to the boxcar and pick up the tramps. They were released without being booked. Well, many people know the book Coup d'etat by A.J. Weberman, where he makes the allegations that two of the three men that were taken away were E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis, and many of you have the book and you've seen the picture of the tramps. We know that three men were paraded off and have been described as the tramps. There's no picture of these three men picking up any shells at Dealey Plaza. He says that they were picking up shells, but there's no evidence that these three men leaned down and picked up a shell. I've seen all the pictures of Dealey Plaza that are available, but I've never seen a picture of these men picking up the shells. The only photograph we have are the three men being led away by men disguised as Dallas police. In the gemstone file, he said the Dallas police ordered the cops to go over the boxcar, but there's no tape recording of it. There's no proof that the Dallas police were ordering anybody. There is evidence that men wearing the uniforms of the Dallas Police Department were carrying, escorting three men away from the scene, but later they couldn't be identified as Dallas 
policemen. So this kind of um, reasoning or misinformation that's in the gemstone file should be broken down very seriously, and you should ask for your evidence and realize that not all of it is true and that it's very dangerous to go by this file. I'll read you some more quotes. He said, The rest is history after John Kennedy was killed. Aristotle Onassis was so confident of his control over the police, the media, the FBI, the CIA, the Secret Service, and the United States judicial systems that he had JFK murdered before the eyes of the nation, then systematically bought off, killed off, or frightened off all witnesses, and then put a 75-year seal of secrecy over the entire matter. Now, if you think seriously about that statement, you realize that Aristotle Onassis didn't have that kind of power. He didn't control Earl Warren. He never was around the United States to control the Dallas Police Department. People like Neakros, his competitor, or Tom Pappas, the Greek uh, shipping oil clerk who had entree into the White House with Spiro Agnew and Richard Nixon and the Rockefellers, had more political clout than any Aristotle Onassis had in this country. And it seems that the whole gemstone file has two scapegoats. One is Onassis, and the other is the Mafia. Uh, Onassis had some kind of information, but I think Onassis was a victim. I think that Jacqueline Kennedy was sent to Onassis to babysit him. He put up a large amount of money to try and find out who killed John Kennedy, and there's been stories that that's the reason his own son was murdered. And then the Akros uh, murdered Onassis' ex-wife. He was murdered, and the man wasn't even held for charges. And Onassis then died alone and had to kick out Marie Collas and make way for Jackie. I think that Onassis was curious and maybe wanted to know the way the narcotics traffic was going to flow. He has a big investment here and so forth. But I can't believe that Onassis has this clout over the entire Warren Commission or Lyndon Johnson. He dealt with a different ball of wax at a different level, and he didn't have the control over the system. Furthermore, Onassis is dead, and all of these witnesses now that are being killed off are escalating. Uh, people like George DeMorin, Shield, and Gary Powers, and William Sullivan of the FBI, and uh, Carlos Prius Nicolette, Charles Nicoletti, all these deaths, the last uh, six FBI men that died in the last six months that I've talked about, they're, the witnesses are dying like flies, and Onassis isn't around to reap the benefits. So for some reason or other, uh, Bruce Roberts had a fixation about the power of Aristotle Onassis. And I think, in the end, when the power control group took over, Onassis was a victim like Richard Nixon, and uh, he was under the control of people. He became victimized, and it was not Onassis who had the power. Now, the gemstone goes into various payoffs that people involved in the assassination had, and I tend to agree with him on that point. He talks about John Roselli, who got a $250,000 finder's fee for bringing Howard Hughes to Vegas in 67. Uh, that was just a clear-cut payoff and may have had something to do with his links to Jack Ruby and having Ruby kill Lee Harvey Oswald. He cited Jimmy Fratriano getting a $109,000 loan, a non-repayable, in California and start a trucking company in Imperial Valley. Eugene Brading became a charter member of La Costa Country Club, the Mafia Heaven. Gerald Ford of the Warren Commission was appointed president of the United States by Richard Nixon. John McCone, who covered this up, uh, former head of the CIA, became a member of the ITT Board of Directors. Richard Helms became CIA director. Leon Jaworski became the special Watergate prosecutor. He calls that government in theater. And then two people who got uh, their reverse payoffs who were hurt by some of this assassination inquiry was a Dr. Red Duke, he cites, who dug two bullets out of John Connolly and saved his life and then was shipped to Afghanistan by the CIA to hush up the information about the bullets in John Connolly. And then he cites Jim Garrison, who had all his witnesses shot out from under him and was framed and charged with bribery and extortion. There is no doubt that there was a lot of payoffs for people that covered up the Kennedy assassination. Uh, Bruce Roberts goes into Daniel Ellsberg. He said in May 1971, folk hero Daniel Ellsberg, the war hawk from Rand Corporation, who designed the missile ring around the Iron Current, and released the fake Pentagon Papers. It distracted attention from John Kennedy's death, Robert Kennedy's death, Martin Luther King's murder, Howard Hughes' disappearance. 
He said the Pentagon Papers were designed by Ellsberg and ran Chief McNamara, who became the World Bank head, to make the Vietnamese War look like one of those incredibly dumb mistakes. Now, I take issue with the gemstone file on this and many other uh, points. I'll explain why on this issue. And then if any of you want the copy of the gemstone file, the 20 pages, you can write to me. It comes about 10 cents a page for $2. I'll mail you. I got letters last week, and I'll mail you your own set so you can read and analyze it. If the purpose of Ellsberg's coming forward was to hide the assassination information, it had the opposite effect. The very first broadcast I had on KLRB was in May 1971, and I was asked to analyze the Pentagon Papers and what it meant at the time. And I said that the Pentagon Papers was maybe a moment of truth coming through and that the real truths to go over the air would be the stories of the killing of John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. And that's when I began my programs here on this station, and we've been on six and a half years. The Pentagon Papers hardly hushed up the political assassinations but opened up a Pandora's box. Another point is that I have read the Pentagon Papers very carefully, and in them, Daniel Ellsberg makes it very clear by printing the State Department papers that the death of John Kennedy began the escalation of the war in Vietnam, that November 24, 1963, for no noticeable reason, the northern Vietnamese came down um, just exact place where they had been up to the time of the death of Kennedy, but the South Vietnamese escalated the war with the American troops. And he showed in the Pentagon Papers that we had been planning this war for a long time, and evidently we had to have Kennedy dead before they could escalate and begin the war, and Lyndon Johnson was their man. So Bruce Roberts is very unfair about that. I think that the Pentagon Papers also showed our American assassination team for what it was. It showed very clearly the murder of DM and his brother-in-law, implicated uh, Henry Cabot Lodge in Washington, the powers that be in Washington. It was the first glimpse of the assassination teams running from Washington, D.C. that were spreading all over the world. The Pentagon Papers was a major contribution, and Bruce Roberts has put it down as being fake. A lot of people have tried to discredit Daniel Ellsberg. If they do, they haven't read the papers. I've read them, and I believe that they were a major contribution. And after they were published... Louis Tack, Louis Tackwood of the Los Angeles Police Department came forward and told about Squad 19 and the plans to kill Nixon and about the Watergate team in the White House. He identified with Daniel Ellsberg and began to spill stories. Uh, one of them I'll go into next week about Louis Tackwood and a lawsuit going on now up in the Marin County. I'll be on that next week with you. Uh, Tackwood came forward because Daniel Ellsberg did. And then a man named Larry Shears came forward and talked about how alcohol, tobacco, and firearms were going to kill Cesar Chavez. And they saved the life of Cesar Chavez by exposing the assassination teams of the Treasury Department. And then Mr. Martinez came in to the Chicano um, riots in Los Angeles, the agent provocateurs. Ellsberg was a source of um, inspiration to Colonel Hibbert over Vietnam. He was a major contributor to getting some truths out. Sure, there's things he knows that he didn't tell, and he could tell us a lot more. But I don't think the burden was on Daniel Ellsberg. I think he did a magnificent job. There are many things about the uh, gemstone papers which I like. There are many which I know are absolutely wrong. Uh, you have to read history. You have to read seven or 800 books like I've done to make an analysis. But I did promise you I would go into it and you can get a copy of the skeleton key yourself and read it. I think that's enough for me to cover on Dialogue Conspiracy, and I hope it's clear to you, and the best thing you can do is then read it for yourself. In the meantime, this is Mae Brussel and Carmel. Have a good year. We're starting a good year, 1978, and I'll see you next week on Dialogue Conspiracy. You've been listening to Dialogue Conspiracy with Mae Brussel. 